Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wagner. Front and center this hour, bracing for more volatility. What a flurry of new trades could be revealing about the road ahead for stocks and your money. We debate that with the Investment Committee. Joining me for the hour today at Post Night at the New York Stock Exchange. There's Joe Terranova and Surat Satir in the house. Steve Weiss, Amy Raskin with us as well today. Let's check the markets. We did have a pretty nice bounce off the open, though. You can see here a lot of that has now evaporated. Dow's good for just less than 70 points. S&P 3987. And there is the Nasdaq, which is still positive as well. But, Joe, I go to you first. And I referenced this series of trades that the Wall Street Journal noted from the CBOE and their data. More call options betting on the VIX will rise have changed hands on an average day in February than at any time since March of 2000. What does that tell you about what may lie ahead for volatility in this market? It tells me where sentiment is, and sentiment right now is back to being <coughs> uniquely bearish the way it was in the fourth quarter. We're seeing that type of bearishness play out once again. I, I wouldn't get too excited over this little bounce that we're having today. S&P has to get above 40, 50 to reverse a lot of the negative momentum from last week. So a lot of the conversations that I've had in the last several days, and really it's, it's in the financial advisor community, is if they're sitting on cash right now, right, what's the incentive for them to be compensated to take the risk where the runway right now seems a lot longer with monetary policy, there's so many unresolved answers, mm -hmm. whether or not the earnings contraction that we saw in the most recent reporting season is going to evolve into an actual earnings recession. So why step in? And there's competition right now for equities in the form of a higher yield. It's just a very difficult environment, and that is extrapolating lead into this consolidation type range. Oh, how things, Surat, change in the course of two to two and a half weeks. I feel like that strong employment report was yes. kind of a gut punch for the bulls because it only reinforced what the Fed was going to do. You had some tough, tough Fed speak since then, but the bulls had the upper hand, at least to start the year. Sentiment seemed to have changed. Momentum was back in the market. And then here we are questioning everything again. Yeah, Scott, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, when we started the year, leading indicators were coming down. Inflation numbers were, were kind of subdued. We were talking disinflationary. Then all of a sudden... Right. Jay Powell said okay. it like a thousand times right. in the news conference. Disinflationary, right? And then all of a sudden you get that strong employment number. The PCE comes out stronger. All of a sudden the bond market now in the short end is going higher and higher. The back end is still lower. So that's kind of conflicting. But when you get, to your point, Joe, a six-month treasury, I was having a, call, a talk with a client today at 5%. And, you know, do you take that opportunity with excess cash or side on cash and say, we would always talk about if you have cash on the side, what are you going to do with it, right? Right now, you have 5% for six months. So what are you going to, you know, what's the downside of that? There are versus... even some daily money markets that are out there competing with with the yield you're getting from treasuries at, you know, plus four and a half percent, which to your points makes the bonds versus stocks argument, you know, the most compelling that it's been in, a, in an awfully long time. Look, it, it, the market is, is always, and that's why there's volatility, and you began the show highlighting the volatility, the, the increase in, in, in actions for options uh, during the month of February. There's always volatility in the market. There's always the appearance of, of having uncertainty, but this seems like the uncertainty that's been permeating throughout 2022 is now extending into 2023. It's staying around a little bit longer right. than investors are comfortable with. And, and I think that feels a little bit different than the way we felt over the last 13 years since the great financial yeah. crisis. And you don't have the liquidity there anymore, Scott. The liquidity is not there to kind of sop up the pessimism. So, listen, I told you the other days, I, I, I'd be surprised if we go back to the lows from right. October. I think we're safe there. But I also don't think we're racing back towards 4,800. I think we've got a marked time. It's the enemy of the market right now. Yeah. Guilty until proven innocent, I suppose, Amy, is, is the way that these rallies are going to be judged. Mike Wilson, you know, triples, quadruples down today. Given our view that the earnings recession is far from over, we think March is a high-risk month for the next leg lower in stocks. Ultimately, we think this rally is a bull trap. Look, you, you've been... I think you've been fairly negative, but I feel like over the last couple of times you've been on, you've tried to see a, you know, a little more positivity in, in things. But here we go. Sentiment feels like it's all, all of a sudden reversed back to being overly negative. Well, I think what we're seeing now is that the economy is running hotter than people expected. I mean, much hotter, hotter than people expected. And inflation's running hotter than people expected. So as long as those two are going together, 
I'm not overly worried about it. I think the bare case scenario is that inflation stays very high and the economy falls apart. And, and we're not getting that. Sort of the bull case scenario is that inflation comes down and the economy stays okay. We're not getting that either. And that's what I think people were looking for coming into the year. But obviously, employment and inflation are the two metrics that people are focused on. And so your bearishness or bullishness depends on what your outlook for both of those are. And if they're going together as they are now, that they're both hotter than people expected, I think we are kind of in this trading range. Um, you'll get you'll get the breakout when you see one move before the other. If you see employment come down and inflation stay up, you're going to market's going to trade down. If you see the reverse, inflation come down while employment stays up, you know that's mm -hmm. that's the bull case. And I think the the jury's still out. And and since we've been running at this pace that nobody expected for longer than expected, I think it makes the uncertainty around what that final outcome is even greater, which is why you're seeing the rise in volatility. Weiss, you got a lot of company today on your side of the ledger. That's for certain. Well, you know, Mike Wilson, I, I mentioned him already, but Dubrovko Lakos, JP Morgan, the risk reward for equities on attractive at current levels, particularly for small caps. Wolf today now believe it's likely the Fed will have to go to 6% and set inflation on a sustainable path downward. Unfortunately, we see more downside for equities. Greg Branch, you might recall uh, in closing bell, and a conversation we had on Friday was talking about 6% to 6.25%. Bespoke, for now, the burden of proof has shifted to the bulls. Jonathan Krinsky over the weekend talks about, you know, opening the door back to the December lows of 37.75. So you guys got a lot of company on your side. Yeah, and look, I'm less concerned about whether we go to 6.5% or 6% or 5 and 3 quarters. That's not where my focus is. My focus continues to be on the direction. Because by the time we get to pick a number, 6 and a quarter, let's cut, cut it in half, um, you know, the market will have already discounted that. But what it's not discounting at this point is, as Mike Wilson points out, the earnings recession. And earnings are atrophying. Yet you still have a market like today, based upon a durable goods number, with you, if you break out transportation, was actually strong. Sure, the revisions were down, but the Fed's not seeing enough of a result given their massive tightening policy. So I continue to be overall bearish. I believe that if you do have you know, super long-term money, you can pick your stocks and invest along the way. But as Joe put, put out, you know, at the top of the show and Sarat came and chimed in behind him, you've got a very compelling alternative opportunity in treasuries. And by the way, they're tax advantaged. So why not invest there at 5% on the short end of the curve and just relax? Don't worry about the volatility if that's what you do and pick your spots to go in on a long-term basis. Is this now, Joe, going to be the biggest problem for stocks is you just have too much competition? And I mean, not only from the, the bond market and credit treasuries and what have you, but those who think that even outside the U.S. is better than in for a variety of, of reasons. But this notion that bonds are the place to be again, right, that conversation had really percolated for a while. And then it was like, OK, got a little something at our backs here, maybe for equities. And now here we are having the same conversation again. In combination with the uncertainty, a very uncertain environment. You know, Amy talked about the durable goods um, numbers from this morning. The pending home sales, what, what does that really show us? That shows us that the stimulus money is still in the economy. There is an insatiable demand still from the consumer to go out and buy things. So you relax mortgage prices for one month. It shows up in pending home sales right. in a one month surge. Right. So like, what Which is that? Diana Olick was, was you know, pointing out, of course, don't expect it to hang on because rates are back up. No, but that's, that takes the temperature of where we are at with the consumer and with the economy. And you know what? My biggest fear has always been that the Federal Reserve will reach a point where monetary policy will be ineffective in being able to bring down inflation, and then they'll just keep raising rates and raising rates, and then they break it. At a certain point, I think monetary policy needs a little bit of an effort from fiscal policy to kind of yeah, but, but mop up some of the stimulus. But the not doing it. It's doing the other thing. It's offsetting the, the tightening. It, we're spending money on all these programs for infrastructure. Well, then so, if the Federal Reserve keeps going, they're going to break it. Unless yeah. you guys are just too negative in that, you know, inflation is going to start coming down at a, at a faster clip. Like a Tom Lee would say, they're constructive. No big shock. But, but he's sticking with his call. 
constructive on 2023. Still see our base case, a stock market that will surprise forcefully, use the word forcefully to the upside. Your Denny, you know, confirms, confirming today his soft landing outlook. New bull market was born last October. It's just not bursting out of the gate so, as, as most bulls do. So one of the things I would add is, at least we're not changing our equity exposure. We're just not going to the high end and we're not adding any more because you are getting paid to wait. So it's not that I'm getting out of the market, you know, and, and saying I'm going to come back in. What I'm just saying is I'm not going to add any more risk right now to equities. Within the equities, I'll rebalance. And on the cash side that I have, if I have additional capital, I'll keep my, my fixed income allocation. This idea, Amy, about, you know, the environment being good to add risk, even selectively, are you, are you able to, to get away from the, you know, the, the big macro and, and go down to the micro and granular level and say, OK, you know, this stock in this sector, you know, sure. irrespective of the kind of conversation that, that we're all having today, I still can find value in the market. And if you answer that question, yes, tell me where. Sure, there's still value in the market. I mean, we've uh, moved a lot well, overseas. Um, we think there are a lot of good values there. Um, I think in healthcare area, there's some really good innovations and good value to be had. Um, we've added to some um, industrials lately. So I think there is definitely value to be had in the market. Um, you know, my my concern, my my problem with the big bear case is that if you get this huge earning recession, earnings recession that Mike Wilson's talking about, you are also going to get lower inflation. And that will lower yields and that will sort of raise the, you know, turn the market. I actually don't think this huge earnings recession is such a bear case for the market. I mean, most of the time when earnings go down, the market actually goes up. So I think you have to talk about both sides when you're talking about inflation and um, and interest rates. You have to talk about both sides, the inflation and the economic impact. And again, I think as long as they're moving together, you're not going to get a big swoon either way. It's when it's, in my opinion, it's when one breaks. Um, but I do think to, to your question earlier, you know, bonds do make a compelling investment opportunity now, um, and they haven't for a long time. So we haven't really seen the huge outflow of equities um, that might still be from equities that might still be in front of us. But and that's I, I guess I would, I guess I would push back on, on part of what you said, on the idea that you know if if earnings do decline, the reason why you have to worry about it is because. You can't justify the valuations that stocks are, are trading at, in, especially in a market environment where we've had pure multiple expansion to get to even where we are at, at the present time. So if you think that future earnings are going to be lower, on what basis could you possibly justify the market trading at the 18 times that it currently trades at? Right. Well, I think, I mean, that's that's the the million dollar question. I mean, last year, all we did, all we saw was earnings was uh, multiple contraction. Earnings were actually up last year and the market was down because the multiple came down. So where's what's the fair value multiple for the market? Um, if I, I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if earnings came down dramatically, not if they just like fritter down a little bit, but if they came down dramatically, you are going to get people starting to talk about Fed cuts and, and lower interest rates and moving back now, especially that the Fed interest rates are so high that they have room to cut. I wouldn't be surprised if you, people start talking about trough multiples and, and you know, it, it, that you do get a multiple turn or two higher from here. Weiss, how do you want to address that? I, I disagree completely. I think fair value for the market should not be at what a free money multiple is which is where we are now. And that the multiple expansion has been just inexplicably uh, dislocated from reality. So you will get earnings coming down. That's clear. If you haven't, the Fed's just going to do 50s instead of 25s because they recognize that we've got sustainably high wages. Uh, we've got sustainably high employment and inflation. The easy part of hitting inflation, that's been done. Now's when inflation is really dug in and it's going to take a lot more work. So to think that the Fed's going to go to six or six and a quarter or even stay where they are and then pivot to a cut, I just think is, is misplaced. They're going to pause first. 
You've got, the Fed takes a much longer term view on their credibility, or they should, and look at where they screwed up, where they screwed up is staying too easy for too long. So where are multiples in a restrictive economic environment? Well, they're not at 18 times, that's for sure. And we've got to stop referencing the last 10. I'm not saying Amy's doing this. Amy and I work together. She's a phenomenal investor. I'm saying that overall, the market's got to stop referencing the last 10 to 15 years of historically low interest rates and believe that's the normal. That's what we're going to go back to. We're not. We're going to go back to where you've got restrictive being or neutral being three to five percent on Fed funds. So I'm more negative so, than that. I don't yeah. see multiple I expansion continuing unless because earnings drop like a, like a rock. Right. But that's that's sort of my point. I don't think we're going to get dramatic multiple expansion unless, you know, exactly as Steve said, and Steve is a great investor too, and I miss working with him, but it is, you know, I'm just saying sure the, the you fair do. case scenario <laughs> is that sure multiple, you, you know, yeah, I do. I really do, actually. And I miss seeing him um, in person. But we, I do think that is the bear case scenario that I think people are saying is that multiple, that, that earnings are going to fall off a cliff and we're going to get this major earnings recession, but you're not going to get any response on the other side. And I just, I don't see that scenario. I don't see the earnings falling off a cliff. I think the economy is actually holding up much better than anybody expected, and I think that will continue. So I'm not mm -hmm. expecting the multiple expansion, but if you do get the earnings falling off a cliff, I do think you are going to see some response from um, from the Fed and from um, just multiples, because that's that's historically what what happens. Oh, uh, did you see Joe, by the way, Kathy Wood I did. Uh, on the network, you know, I don't know, Said hello to a couple her. hours ago? <laughs> Uh, I've never seen the market this dislocated, she said. Uh, the equity market is beginning to see the other side. If it can see the other side, we should be okay. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting, too, obviously. On the recent rush about, you know, speculative stocks, the kind of which, you know, she has a lot in, in her portfolio, um, she said, we don't really have animal spirits in the market chasing these. When when asked, you know, directly about like, what do you make of the fact that it's a lot of this highly speculative names that have run up, a lot of the highly shorted names. We don't have animal spirits in the markets chasing these, talking about these new technologies. What do you, what do you make of that comment? Okay, so um, Kathy has a publicly traded strategy, as do I, and with that comes the criticism. And my response to that would be this. You said before, maybe you guys are too bearish. I'm not bearish on price. I'm bullish on price. I'm bearish on time. And because I'm bearish on time, I don't believe the factors of long duration, low liquidity, and high beta in such an uncertain environment where I'm bearish in time can continue to lead the market higher. I think- Do you think the market's cheap enough? I think the market needs to prove the multiple that it's now trading at, the S&P 19 times, NASDAQ trading at 32 times. I think the answer to that resides itself over the coming quarters. Therefore, how am I invested? I'm invested boring. I'm invested in industrials, materials, healthcare, financials. That's where I'm overweight. I'm invested in quality. I'm not invested in high beta, low liquidity, long duration. I think we're okay. Ed Yardeni, I think Ed Yardeni's right. I just think Ed Yardeni is wrong in terms of time. Time is the enemy. I don't believe- well, how long do you, does the bear market need to last before you decide that it's been long enough? I think the market will tell us the answer to that. I think earnings will, over the coming quarters, confirm if we've had enough of a multiple and valuation contraction. But how can the price be right if we expect earnings to come in more? I didn't say you think the they've dropped? I, what, no, no, no. I didn't say the price was right. I said the multiple needs to prove itself over the coming quarters. No, but you said that the problem... I'm, two I'm things. bullish There's on price. price. You said Absolutely. you're bullish on price. I am. I am bullish on price. I'll tell you why. If the market were to fall back to the October lows, I think that's a tremendous opportunity. An absolute tremendous opportunity. So I'm not smart enough to say, okay, I'm going to come out of the market. I'm going to take the 5% yield and then I'm gonna be fast enough to know when the market goes down and finally has the capitulation that I need to get back in. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stay invested, but I'm gonna do it in a way that right now is unpopular, a way that's underperforming the market so far year to date, a way that focuses on what's the balance sheet look like? Is it quality in its nature? That's where I wanna be. And that allows me to ride out time. Yeah, I understand, but 
but are you are you bullish on the S and P at four thousand? That's the price, or are you bullish fourteen percent lower where the October lows were? If I'm bullish on the S and P at four thousand, I'm nothing more than a closet indexer. Okay. So I'm not looking at that. I'm trying to outperform the S&P. Do I think the S&P belongs at 4,000? Quite honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I think the answer to that resides itself in the coming quarters when earnings have to prove themselves. It's about earnings proving themselves. And that's where the uncertainty lies Over in this there. environment. Okay. Scott, if I thought, hold on. If I thought the S&P was justified at 4,000, if I thought in the coming quarters that earnings were actually going to confirm the multiple expansion, I would be invested in a more aggressive way. I would be going out well, then and not, I would be Then you're not bullish duration. price then. A bullish price because overall, I think the upside potential for where the market is in the long term relative to the downside potential far outweighs being invested in the market. It's just how you want to invest. I think you're asking the question whether we should invest in this environment. I'm not asking whether you should invest in this environment. I'm just playing off of the sort of the two main mm -hmm. features of the bear market, a bear market, are right. price and time. Correct. Okay? Have we spent enough time in no. a bear market no. for some to say, okay, that's long enough? No. So, right? We I'm simplifying not. it, obviously. We have not. The other is price. Mm -hmm. are, are stocks reasonably priced where they are now based on where earnings expectations are? Some would suggest no. When you make a comment like I'm bullish price, that tells me that you think the market's fairly valued now or you, you think there are opportunities. It's cheap. You I said you're bullish price. I think when I look at the risk reward, I see the multiple contraction that we've had within the market. I'm willing to take some risk in a very measured way in the market because I believe, okay. I believe over the long term we're going to be okay. Can the S and P fall from 4,000 down to 3,500? Without question. And quite candidly, that's probably the best thing for all of us. Let's get it over with. Let's have capitulation once and for all. Surat, I mean, look, to me, we're at this period where you have so much counter, so many countervailing forces, right? And to try and time this mark is impossible. I've said that forever. I think you stay invested to your point. Price on certain parts of the market is cheap. Certain parts of the market, not the overall market. And that's kind of where you're, you are and we are. What's the cheapest part of the market right now? So, uh, again, let's you, not make broad comment. I want specific. Uh, financials. Ooh, we said that same, same time. Uh, yeah. Financials. Yeah, you look at Morgan Stanley, 10 times earnings. Look at Bank of America, you know, nine times earnings. Think energy's expensive? No. So, so, so there's, and you're getting paid two, three percent there. You got parts of healthcare. You get the Bristol's, the J and J's. They're all lower than what the market is. So these are companies that have secular growth. They're just not ready yet to outperform until we get some of these macro headwinds out of the way. Okay. All right. Let's take a break. When we come back, speaking of energy, the oil slide. Energy is the worst sector this month. Goldman Sachs, though, is now seeing upside in one name that has been outperforming this year. A member of the investment committee owns it, which means we will trade it in our call of the day in two minutes. At least 15 energy names, either personally owned or in the Joe T. That's Shell right. not being one of them. Why it is, is that? not. Um, the geographic. We can't own everything, obviously. Well, but, no, but why? We're, we're, we're U.S. listed in, in our nature. Um, Amy is totally right. Shell's one of the one of the purest international plays you could find in the market. Very strong presence, by the way, uh, in Africa, which will be an economy that grows over the coming quarters. Mm -hmm. But just overall, I mean, you've got the oxy earnings coming up this week, and you're going to be talking about a record quarter. Those are today. So oxy today. Oxy's. I think oxy's tomorrow. Actually, uh, today, tomorrow. I think it's. I, th I think it's tomorrow. Um, but you're going to talk about a record quarter with. Two, two and a half to three billion and free cash flow generation. And that's exactly what you want these energy companies to be doing right now. So a lot of the contraction in energy equity so far year to date is attributed to the free fall in natural gas and the pullback to crude oil itself. But overall, I still believe you maintain an overweight exposure because they have told you on multiple occasions, the CEOs, have the incentive to do what? Focus on yeah. the shareholder. shareholder they are not incentivized to increase the yeah. production. That speaks favorably when you're maintaining dividends and increasing buybacks. Surat. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. And, and, and when you the CEO calls this quarter have been, hey, our costs are going up. 
right now, but we're, the costs are going up not because we're increasing production, it's because we're maintaining our production and excess capital will be sent back to shareholders. I think you had a run in energy last, last year. I think you have to kind of come back and as soon as you see the economy stabilize, energy is going to be the place to be again. We have a slight overweight as well on energy, and I, I like to keep it. And if the stocks keep on pulling back because of, quote, peak earnings, I think the opportunity to buy some of the really good ones like Pioneer EOG are going to be there. By the way, Oxy earnings after the close today, the call is tomorrow. Are you, are you correcting yourself or me? I'll, I'll take the hit. Okay, okay thanks. I'm, I'm just making sure. But the call is tomorrow. Yeah, I know. Okay. But, but the, earnings are, but the earnings are today. Listen, when it's between right? you the and I, are I'm today. always wrong. Well, I mean, that the earnings, makes our relationship work. Well, the earnings are today. I mean, right. the, the facts are the facts. Yes, sir. If the facts Correct. are in my favor, they're not yes. in yours. Yes, sir. All right, coming up, <laughs> how to play the recent rise in yields in the ETF market. We break it down in today's ETF Edge. But first, as we head to break, a message from Pivotal Advisors CEO Tiffany McGee as CNBC celebrates Black Heritage. I graduated from Morgan State University which is an historically black university. And my HBCU experience shaped who I am today. It gave me the space to learn and grow in an environment where I could unapologetically be myself. It gave me the tools to navigate an industry where often I'm the only one in the room. It set a standard and an expectation for excellence. And it gave me the audacity to dream big. I'm Bertha Coombs. Here's our CNBC News update at this hour. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in Ukraine today telling President Volodymyr Zelensky the U.S. will stand with Kyiv for as long as it takes. During her surprise visit, she also welcomed his ongoing actions to address the nation's corruption problem. CNBC has learned that five banks accused of playing a part in Alan Stanford's massive Ponzi scheme have agreed in to an out-of-court settlement to pay a total of $1.6 billion. The money would go to investors who bought fraudulent certificates of deposit uh, more than uh, a decade ago. If a court approves, it will bring the total amount recovered to more than $2.7 billion dollars. That's around 40 percent of investor losses. And saying the corporate kingdom has finally come to an end, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill today giving him control of Walt Disney World's self-governing district. It's a response to the company's opposition to the state's don't say gay law, as critics call it. It does maintain the Disney's debt position in place, but for DeSantis, who may run for president, it's another chapter as he has a new book coming out tomorrow in which he criticizes what he calls woke capitalism. Scott, back over to you. All right, Bertha, thank you, Bertha Coombs. Now to Bob Pisani with today's ETF Edge. Hey, Bob. It was declared dead a year ago, but now the 60-40 stock bond portfolio may be making a comeback with yields on two-year treasuries now approaching 5%. Bonds are becoming serious competition for the stock market and single treasury bond ETFs. They're seeing big inflows. Let's talk with Alex Morris. He's the president and CIO of FM Investments. You know, Alex, uh, everyone wants to buy two-year treasuries. I was at a party at my uh, mother's house over the weekend. She asked me about them. My brother-in-law asked me about them. Uh, you launched these single bond ETFs over six months ago, three months, two year, 10 year treasuries. You've added one year treasuries. Explain to us how do these work? What do you get when you buy, for example, a two year treasury ETF? Well, you get just that, the two year treasury ETF. We roll it regularly to make sure you stay on the run. And it's important that folks understand that the treasury department will issue new bonds all the time. But the ones that are most liquid, the ones that provide the yield, the numbers that you see on TV here on CNBC, that's the on the run. So when you buy the two-year ETF, you get the two-year so, on-the-run treasury. So you roll over every month. You roll into whatever the new, they have auctions every month for two-year treasuries. You roll into that one every single month. So you're getting the current, uh, what's called on-the-run yield. That's correct. Okay. Now, I see very large inflows into these short maturity treasury ETFs, three months, one year, two years. I don't see so much interest in longer maturity, like a 10-year, and I don't see much inflows into corporate treasuries right now, or corporate bonds. Why is that, and why is everybody so interested in short maturity, and short maturity treasuries in particular? Well, I think it's because the yields are so great. The one year is yielding over 5%. It's been a long time since we've seen that happen, and there's no credit risk. If you go and start buying corporate bonds, they may yield the same, maybe slightly more, but you have a risk of default. 
There's no. not that risk with the U.S. Treasury series. And, and why do we need an ETF to do this? You know, I, I mean, I could go on. My mother can go on Treasury Direct and buy two-year, ten-year directly. You you have an e, a vehicle, an ETF, where you can do the same thing. But what, what does an ETF vehicle get us that we wouldn't get from going directly to the, the government? Sure. So you get the same bond ultimately. But anyone who wants to try, I encourage them to do it. Going to Treasury Direct is it's cumbersome. You have another account. And then when it's time to roll the bond, it's more, more work, more hassle. And even at your brokerage account, you might set up the auto roll feature, but it won't ultimately get you the same price. And you got to remember that you set that subscription before you are returned to cash or reinvested. Yeah, important thing, too, is remember, it's a little confusing. I've, I've tried doing this on, for example, a big brokerage account. Uh, there's a confusing, bewildering amount, even if you go into the two-year choice of what, what you can buy because they're not necessarily buying the one that's in the front month that's going ahead of you. You're, you're buying stuff that's in the secondary market. So it is rather difficult. There's 24 of them, at least, at any given time. And I don't remember uh, how much I dislike fractions when they came out. I've learned to get good at them. But bonds still trade in fractions. They have their own language. And the treasuries have yet another level of sophistication yeah. on them. We're going to have much more on using ETFs to invest in bonds. It's coming up on ETF Edge. Now, Alex is going to be joined by Dave Nautic. He's the financial futurist for Vetify and an expert in all things ETFs. Now, learn why ETFs may be, as Alex says, a plausible alternative to buying bonds directly from the government. That's ETFedge.cnbc.com, 1 p.m. Eastern. Scott, back to you. Hi, right, Bob. Thank you, Bob Pisani. All right, up next, economic illiterate. Those sharp words from Warren Buffett as the billionaire blast critics of share buybacks. The committee, of course, weighing in on that debate next. They're writing, quote, when you are told that all repurchases are harmful to shareholders or to the country or particularly beneficial to CEOs, you are listening to either an economic illiterate or a silver-tongued demagogue, characters that are not mutually exclusive, end quote. Uh, I want to debate this because a lot of people are talking about this today. Joe, you talk about buybacks all the time. He's all the time. He's 100% correct. I don't understand um, why it is that anyone would suggest that buybacks are ineffective, inefficient, or potentially disruptive to the market. It's exactly as a shareholder the type of capital allocation behavior that you want from management. Well, that's not the argument. I support that the, it. That's not the argument that the critics make, though. Mm -hmm. the, the argument the critics make, principally mm -hmm. politicians, yes. uh, are there, they're a, you know, just a gift to shareholders and to the wealthy. That, that's the argument. That's economically. It's hard, it's hard to make an argument. That's economically Ill illiterate. It is. I'm sorry. And you well, know what? It's, it's, not what economic, a it's not accurate because who are the shareholders? Are they pension funds? Are they retirement funds? Are they in your 401k? So if you're trying to optimize the return and you are a corporation and you say, what are my choices? Buy back shares at X return, go build a factory at Y return, or give wages to uh, people at or, Z return. Or, 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 a dividend, but, or a dividend. Or a dividend. But buybacks, the supporters say, are, are just a much more efficient use of capital. Absolutely. Of course it is. I mean, it's 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 clear that if if a buyback doesn't work, then management is going to be beholden to it to their shareholders. And it's happened in the past. It's happened when Merrill Lynch did it in 07, 08. And it, it's it's happened when companies have done it. Look what Meta did it at high prices. Well, mega cap tech companies are the ones who, generally speaking, lead in buybacks. T take the other side of it for one second. OK, take take the argument that they're 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 poor uses of capital and that you know, that's something that they should be doing, which is what we hear from Washington, D.C. OK, margins contract, EPS contracts. W what is what is it that a CFO and CEO is supposed to be doing? Just sitting there and allowing that to happen or going in, buying back their stock and allowing EPS to steady itself. Right. Why would you not? Why would you want a different type of behavior as a shareholder? That's exactly and, what you want. And take the other side. Look at Apple, right? I mean, where would Apple be today if it hadn't bought back? Buys back probably more than anybody, right. given its size. And, All and, the bank and, accounts. And, and, and nobody looks at it negatively because the stock's been rising. So we look at it on the other side. So then it's, maybe it's time to look at management teams at that as well. So I, I, I do think, and, and when CEOs make that choice and CFOs, look, a lot of CEOs would love to just keep on buying and bringing their companies bigger. So you've got to give them some credit to say, I'm actually shrinking my company. You think the rank and file shareholder has an issue with buybacks? You think they, they have a problem with buybacks? Of course they don't. Why would they? That was kind of a rhetorical question, but that's why, I'm, yeah. that's why I'm suggesting that, you know, it's obviously become a political hot-button topic, 
um, you know. By the way, the, the, the one percent tax there was, and, and by the way, I, I was thinking that you potentially would see it, a pull forward of buybacks in December. You never no. saw that. So what does that tell you? That tells you that one percent, it's meaningless to a lot. One percent is meaningless. But Weiss, when you, you know, look, the president is talking about four percent, right? That would that would uh, perhaps curtail some CFO behavior if you took the tax to four percent rather than one percent, couldn't it? It, it could. Um, I don't think by much, though. Because it, it's still, look, buybacks are anti-dilutive. And when you have big stock option programs, you're giving out lots of stock to employees. You're buying back stock to try and keep the level set. But none of that, this is not a financial debate. As you point out, Scott, it's purely a political debate. And this is like a dog whistle rallying to the socialists, to the AOCs of the world. Hey, buybacks only impact the wealthy, only impact the executive team. And as as Sarat alluded to, that's dead wrong. More stocks are owned by pensions, by rank and file, by people that are just start scraping by, that don't have direct investing, but do it through their pensions. So it's absolutely asinine to criticize buybacks. And that's really the heart of it. This is just an election rallying call. So I'd ignore it. I don't think 4%, though, does a lot. I don't think deters it. Yeah. Amy, give us your view. No, I agree. I agree, especially with Steve said, you have to offset the dilution if you're going to pay people in stock and, and stock options, which I think is worthwhile to do um, because it gets everybody aligned. It allows more people to benefit from the rise in the stock market. So, um, yeah, I, I think this is this is a political issue more than it's a financial issue. And um, um, I think the the arguments against stock option uh, buybacks are misplaced. All right. Up next, Mike Santoli here with his midday word. We're back right after this. And later we grade your trade. You can email us. It's really great if you're paying too much for the stock. And Buffett has always been very, very strict about this idea that he would prefer that management teams were a little more discerning about how much they're paying for the stock, what price they get it at. He used to have rules about it when he was buying back Berkshire shares. Mm -hmm. Only a certain percentage above book value is what he would buy it at. So I think that there's nuance to it. Uh, I totally agree that the anti-buyback uh, campaign is generally um, kind of demagoguery, and it's not really based on, on how, how companies work. But it's not like this became the standard way companies deal with their capital strictly for tax reasons. Let's be honest. Tax and activist reasons are the two reasons every company buys back stock that has the ability to. Whereas it used to be we'd pay out more in dividends or we'd be more opportunistic about the buybacks. We asked the CEO, I think uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it's Marriott's CEO, would a 4% buyback tax make a difference? He said, nope. It doesn't matter what price we're paying. It's just this is what we do now. Hmm. Give me a quick reaction. Well, I think the activism is, is point is, is really well taken. And it, when you see an activist investor into a company, you immediately say to yourself, OK, PayPal. You saw, you saw right. activism. You said, OK, PayPal is going to buy back their stock. And that's the immediate thought of the financial engineering that's, that's ultimately going to go right. on. But, but Mike's right. It is taxes. It is activism yeah. that's part of the equation. But again, I go back and say, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative was it used to be illegal before like 1982 to do this right. on a regular basis. Now, now I'm not saying that we should go back to that. Um, but I, I do think there's also a misapprehension that buying back your stock automatically makes your stock go up. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all, right? It's, so it's, it's all very, it, it's all, there's a lot of misperceptions no, on no, all no, sides no, of this. No, but listen, when people say buying back your stock is going to have the stock appreciate, they're talking about in the moment. The CEO is right. buying back the stock and Maybe. they're thinking about yeah. the long term in most cases. In some cases, what you'll find is the CEO is trying to get a stock to recover from a very distinct downtrend. And in those cases, well, the CEO is borrowing. They're borrowing the debt market. True. They're borrowing the debt market. That's wrong behavior. That might be pro cyclical, with. right? In 2007, was the record year for buybacks to that point. $600 Worst billion dollars bought back Correct. in 07 at the top. A bigger percentage of total market cap than we're going to buy back this year was bought back in 07, right in time for the market to get cut in half. And in the first quarter of 2009, none of those companies were buying back their stock they were afraid to. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll see you closing. All right. I'm glad you're see here you for sir. that. Yeah, yeah, that's Mike Santoli. Uh, we'll be right back. And it's for you, Joe, from Gary. 
I uh, bought Pfizer at 56. Should I buy more? Uh, obviously, I have news today, uh, reports anyway, of the CGen uh, potential offer. That'd be quite an acquisition. What do you think? Quality company. No, I don't think you should buy any more stocks trading. You used to own CGen, and by the way, I think you do own Pfizer, right? In the Joe T or no? No, I own Merck. Oh, Merck. Merck, Merck is the company to own. Um, these are clearly, you know, CGen. I screwed that trade up for sure. I got out of it way too quickly. But there's been a battle for CGen. But on Pfizer itself, the profitability just hasn't been there in the last four quarters. The stock is struggling. It's lost momentum. It's trading at 41. Don't add to a losing position. Okay. Uh, a reminder, closing bell today. I hope you'll join me at 3 o'clock Eastern time. Victoria Green is joining me on set today along with Mira Pandit. We're going to get you right set for Occidental earnings, which are when, Joe? Occidental earnings are today, Scott. And the earnings call is, is tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes. All right, good. Ed Yardeni is going to be with me as well. So I hope everybody joins me for that. Amy Raskin, you have a final trade? Sure. We like Bannock here. Um, it's the number one global manufacturer of industrial robots. Um, strong backlog, lots of opportunity for margin expansion. Um, Japanese stocks, but has a US ADR. All right. <laughs> Steve Weiss. I'm going to short end of the curve. And Scott, do you know when the Oxy uh, conference call is? Yep, tomorrow, one o'clock, I hear. Great, great. But I think they report today. <laughs> In overtime, they do. Weiss, quick, go ahead. I did, short end of the curve. All right, Surat. I like Delta, I think, with uh, energy prices coming down, demand really high, it's stocks trading at a really cheap multiple. Okay, Joe? MSCI. All right, good stuff, thank you. See everybody, closing bell. Uh, the exchange begins now.